Jesus Christ died, we died with him. Though he slays me, yet will I trust in him. We are continuing this morning our study in the book of Yehuda, um, as translators have called it, Jude. Um, Jude and Judas, basically the exact, they come from the same exact Greek, Greek word, but the translators kind of wanted to distance this letter from Judas, so they called it Jude, figuring you can't figure that out yourself, so, you know, it's, <laughs> this is the letter of Yehuda. Um, Jude is one of the letters that comprise what is called the Jewish epistles, along with Hebrews, James, and 1 and 2 Peter. Jude's letter shares a feature common to all these Jewish epistles. He borrows liberally from Jewish history and writings, and we'll, we'll see that as we go through here. As we said, Jude is the half-brother of Yeshua, he's the full brother of James, who was the author of the book of James, and also a prominent leader in the church in Jerusalem. Now, Tradition tells us, and I'm not saying this is true or not true, but tradition tells us that because of his relationship to Yeshua, Jude's sons and his grandsons were considered descendants of the house of David, and therefore they were a threat to Roman rule. When the Roman Empire Domitian heard that they were proclaiming a new kingdom, he arrested them. He suspected they were trying to reestablish a Jewish kingdom in place of Roman rule. Well, Greek historians record that Jude's grandsons defended themselves by showing the Caesar their rough hands from a life of farming, which proved they were merely working peasants, not nobility, seeking a kingdom in this world. So they were released. They showed them we're workers. So they released them, said, okay, you're not trying to overthrow the kingdom. Uh, Jude's purpose in writing this epistle is to warn the church against false teachers that had infiltrated it. They were people who were perverting grace. These false teachers were turning the grace of God into an excuse for flagrant immorality. That's verse 4. We'll talk about that in the weeks to come. We have said that Jude writes using triads. He likes to use these triads all through the letter. We are looking at that first triad in the end of verse 1 where Jude addresses his audience. He says, to those who are the called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Yeshua the Christ. So Jude says that his audience is called, they are beloved by the Father, and they are kept for Yeshua. Now last week we looked at the first two, and we saw that believers are the called. They are beloved by the Father. Called is a synonym for chosen. Believers, we are the called. We are the chosen. This is not an external call. This is an internal, efficacious call. It's not just an invitation. Like God says, well, I you know, get an invitation in the mail. I would like for you to attend. No, this is uh, driving. This is, an, like I said, it's an efficacious call that brings you to the Lord. It's a moving of God, basically, on the inside. It's a work of the Holy Spirit and what the Bible calls the elect. It's a saving call. It's a call that cannot be resisted because it changes the heart of the people that are called. And the reason we are called is because we are loved of the Father. Now, we spent our time last week talking about the called or chosen. And this is an issue that the church is, of course, greatly divided on. And I think it's an issue that is very important for understanding because if you understand that you are a Christian, only because Yahweh called you, then you will understand, and I think only then will you understand that your salvation is secure. And that's what Jude tells us in this last point of the triad. He says, and kept for Yeshua the Christ. Now the New American Standard here says for, it could be translated by or in. This is a dative in the original language, and it could be read as kept by Christ, kept in Christ or kept for Christ. Any and all these statements could be justified. The word kept here is from the Greek word tereo. And tereo speaks of guarding something which is in one's possession. It means to watch as one would for something, pre a precious thing. The idea is to observe attentively and to retain in custody. 
Jude's readers are kept safe, they are guarded, they are watched over. The perfect tense indicates they have been or are in the present state of being watched, being kept safe from harm, being preserved. What we need to understand this morning is that this is true of all believers. All believers are kept by Yeshua. We see Yeshua talking about this security all through the Scripture, but let's just look at a few verses. In John 6, 37, Yeshua says, All that the Father gives me, it's interesting that the ones who come to Yeshua are a love gift of the Father to the Son, and He says, All the Father gives me will come to me. The, the elect are going to come. He didn't give some and they don't show up. And He says, The one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. This is the idea of calling an election, the one given to Christ, come to Christ. And the ones come, who come, are kept. Verse 39 says, this is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I will lose nothing, but raise it up at the last day. The Father's will is that the ones that have been given to Christ will stay with Christ. They will be resurrected. This is a sure thing. This is, you know, when we looked at this last week in Romans 8, all whom he called, he glorified. It's an unbroken chain. This is the same thing. This is what he's talking about. The ones that are called by Christ come to Christ and are kept for Christ. John 6, 40, for this is the will of my Father. Do you think God gets what he wills? I think there's a pretty safe bet on that, right? This is the will of my Father that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in Him will have eternal life. And I myself will raise Him up at the last day. So everyone who believes in the Son gets eternal life. They get resurrected. Now, they would be resurrected on the last day. That's the last day of the Old Covenant at the return of Christ. We are raised up when we trust in Christ. But see, this is a sure thing. This is... Something, this is definitely security, people. We are secure in Him. John 10, 27 and 28, He says, My sheep hear My voice, and I know them, and they follow Me. And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish. No one can snatch them out of My Father's hand. Who are the sheep? They're the ones that the Father has given Him. And he says, they will never perish. They have received eternal life. No one can remove them from the Father's hand. They are secure in that love. Now, throughout the years, the subject of eternal security has been hotly debated in theology. People hate this doctrine, which amazes me. But I was on that side at one time. I thought this was an abominable doctrine. You know, once saved, always saved. That means you can do whatever you want and you're still saved. Mm, yeah, that might be true, okay? <laughs> there have always been those who affirm you can lose your salvation. And, you know, people talk about a, a lot about the five points of Calvinism, but do you know that Cal that is simply the Calvinistic answer to the five-point manifesto put out by the Belgic semi-Pelagians early in the 17th century? We know this semi-Pelagian manifest as Arminianism, all right? The fifth point states this. Now look at this point of Arminianism. It rests with believers to keep themselves in a state of grace. By keeping up their faith, those who fail here fall away and are lost. Isn't that an encouraging statement? You want to sign up for this faith? You know, you want to sign up for this? Yeah, I like that. I like keep myself in a state of grace. You know, as Christians, do we all live on the brink of damnation? Is our salvation conditioned on our ability to maintain it? You talk about depression. I mean, people get depressed for a lot of things far less significant than this. You know, I can understand depression. I can understand taking massive amounts of Prozac or Abilify if you believe this. You can lose your salvation. You've got to keep yourself saved. You constantly are living in mortal fear. 
The Senate of Dort was convened in 1618 to pronounce on this theology of Arminianism, and the five points of Calvinism represent the counter-affirmations. The Calvinistic fifth point states this, Believers are kept in faith and grace by the unconquerable power of God till they come to glory. Can you say amen to that? Okay. There's a, you, you know, pick one of those. Which one do you like? All right. You want to keep yourselves? Believers to keep themselves, and then we have the believers are kept. The doctrine that says you can lose your salvation puts conditions on maintenance on salvation, it's, on, it's up to you. In other words, God has saved us, but we got to continue to match up to the standard. we got to do the work to keep ourselves safe. And if we fail, we're lost forever. Sad state. The majority of churchgoers do not understand that our salvation is not based on what we do, but upon what Christ did. And I think this is the real issue. This is the problem. People today, for the most part in the church, think salvation is based on what they do. I had a man call me yesterday from Texas. He just read something on the web by us, and he called, and he, he says, I trusted Christ at an early age, but I just walked away, and I did all these things, and I just don't know. You know, I, I read scriptures, and it seems to th you know, say that I can be lost. I said, if you ever were a Christian, you still are a Christian. You know, if you have trusted Christ, if you're trusting in him alone, then you're a Christian. You know, now we went over a lot of scriptures together just trying to give this man some peace, you know, because he was tormented. And I can understand how you would be tormented if you think you can lose this. It's kind of scary. See, but the most Christians think their relationship with God is based on their performance. They think that as long as they live right, God won't condemn them. And usually the things that the live right is man-made standards, not even biblical standards. It's just made up stuff. But this is a works system. To attempt to live the Christian life by works is to live under constant guilt, under constant condemnation. But to understand that salvation is by grace through faith and that we are absolutely secure because of Christ's work, that will bring you great peace and security is vital to peace. You can't have peace if you don't have security. We need to understand that our salvation is based upon the one act of one person, Yeshua the Christ. The security of our salvation is not based on our acts. Just as we were condemned by Adam's act, so we are made righteous by Christ's act. Look at Romans 5.19. It says, for as through the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. That's Adam, okay? Now watch the other side of the equation. Even so, through the obedience of the one, the many were made righteous. So whose obedience gets you to heaven? Christ. It's his obedience through the obedience of the one. We were all condemned through Adam. Understanding our condemnation in Adam <coughs> helps us see that our salvation is not based upon our works, but upon Christ's finished work. Our salvation is secure because it's based on what Christ did for us, not for what we do for ourselves. Can you imagine the emotional state of a child who doesn't know from day to day whether he's a member of the family or not? Today, since he was good... He's considered a member. But tomorrow, if he misbehaves, he's no longer part of the family. He gets kicked out. Today, he's loved by the father. Tomorrow, he may not be. This child will be a neurotic mess. You are part of your family regardless of your behavior. So it is in the family of God. If you belong to Christ, you're part of the family. You can enjoy the emotional security our Heavenly Father wants us to experience. When they built the first section of the Golden Gate Bridge, there's no safety net to protect the workers. 23 workers fell to their deaths in the waters below. Well, the city of San Francisco decided to spend an enormous sum of money to put up a safety net under the new section. But once the safety net was in place, only a handful of workers ever needed it. 
The work went faster. The workers were, could concentrate on their jobs without worrying about the danger below. So they just were happy, healthier, more productive workers because they felt safe. To be a productive Christian, you need to know that your future is secure. You really do. That's why understanding our eternal security is so important. It allows our fears to be dealt with. It gives us confidence for the task at hand and offers emotional stability that we need. If you understand what the Bible says about God's security, you will see that it's God who saves you and God who keeps you. The scriptures are loaded with verses that talk about security. I mean everywhere. I want to look at just a few of them so we can have this idea of the security that's in Christ. Understand what Jude's talking about when he says we are kept. This is one of my favorites, Romans 8.1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Yeshua. Whenever you see therefore, you understand that takes you back to something else. I think this takes us back to 5, 12 through 21, where he's talking about Adam and Christ. And he says, therefore, because of that situation, there is now no condemnation. The Greek word here for condemnation is katachrama. Krima is the normal word for condemnation. Katachrama is only used three times in Scripture, all of them by Paul in Romans. He used it twice in Romans 5. 5.16 says, the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For on the one hand, the judgment arose from one transgression. Now, judgment here is the result of Adam's sin. This is the Greek word krima. It's a sentence. It's a decision on the part of the judge. The sentence from the judge resulted in katachrima. He says, arose from one transgression resulting in condemnation. But on the other hand, the free gift arose from many transgressions resulting in justification. Katakrama is defined by Souter in his lexicon as the punishment following the sentence. It's in a passive formation in the Greek, and it's not likely to refer to the sentence as an edict from the judge, but rather to the punishment. Adam's sin is imputed to all. This is condemnation, which is spiritual death, which is separation from God. Romans 5.18 says, So then, as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men, even so through the act of righteousness there resulted justification of life to all men. Again, in this verse, we see the same thing. Adam's transgression resulted in katakrama, or spiritual death to all men. When Adam sinned, he sinned as a federal head or a representative of man. His sin is imputed to every individual of Adam's race. Everyone born is born spiritually dead, separated from God because of Adam. His act was a representative act. And you and I, as being representatives of our, our federal head, we participate in that act. In Romans 5, 12 through 21, is basically just a comparison of two men, Adam and Christ. The comparison is very simple. There are two men, each performed a single act that brought forth a single result, and the result is experienced by every member of their respective races. In Adam, there was nothing but death and hopelessness. In Christ, there is life, for he brought his people out from under the rule and authority of sin and death. And there will never be, in the life of a believer, spiritual death. It can't be. There will be chastening. There will be discipline in this life, but there will never be separation from God because we are secure in His love. Now, who are those who can lay claim to this no condemnation? The parameters are laid out here. It says those who are in Christ Yeshua. Some are in Him. Some are not in him. Paul assumes this everywhere in his writing. There are those in Christ, there are those outside. Paul was not a universalist. He says explicitly in Romans 9, 3 that there are those who are accursed, separated from Christ. So if you're in Christ, what happened to him happened to you. 
Union with Adam, the first man, led to our condemnation death, and union with Yeshua the Christ, the second Adam, secured our righteousness and our life. And this is the idea of our union with Him who is our representative. It's really at the heart of Pauline theology. It's just union with Christ. You share Christ's righteousness. You receive His righteousness. You share all that He is and has. And I think if people understand this, they're not going to get caught up in this idea of thinking they can lose something. In Romans 8, 2, Paul says, for, which is gar in the Greek, it gives the reason why there's no condemnation. He says, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Yeshua set you free from the law of sin and death. The law of the spirit of life, this is the Torah of the spirit. It introduces to a new facet of Torah, the Torah of the new covenant of the spirit. Paul says that the Torah of the Spirit has set you free. He's using language here of slaves being set free in the, in the Exodus. It's Exodus language. Those in Christ are brought out of Egypt of sin and death and made citizens of the kingdom of God. And Paul puts it in the past tense here. He uses the aorist verb, set you free, which declares something that has already happened by the Spirit's application of our union with Christ. Those who have trusted Christ are free from the law of sin and death. Listen, people, you still sin. But it doesn't lead to death anymore because that law has been broken. It's not the law of sin and death. Christ overcame that. We are no longer in the body of Adam. We are in the body of Christ. And we are secure in Him. Look at Romans 8, 4 and catch this point here. He says, so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now, let me say something about the end there, who do not walk. A lot of people catch on this, and they say, that's right, you, you're not condemned if you walk right. The walk here according to the flesh or Spirit is talking about Old Covenant, New Covenant. That's how Paul used it in this context. All right, so if you're not walking by the Old Covenant, uh, the Old Covenant brings condemnation. It brings death. But if you're walking by the Spirit, you're walking under the New Covenant. And then look, notice that he says the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. The righteous requirement of the Torah are fulfilled in us, believers. We have fulfilled the law completely because of our union with Christ. He kept it completely, so did we. We are righteous. People, please understand, when you get to heaven, it's not like God slipping you in the back door. I'm going to overlook all this mess you people have done. You're really screwed up, but I'm just going to sneak you in. No. When you get to heaven, you have a right to be there because you have fulfilled the righteous requirement of the law in Christ. Now let's drop down to the end of, verse, or the end of chapter 8 where the theme of verses 31 through 39 is the love of Yahweh for his people. In this text, Paul uses seven rhetorical questions. It's interesting. Why seven? Well, in Scripture, seven represents qualitative fullness, complete totality. He says, what shall we say then to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? What are the, these things? Well, I think Paul's talking about everything he said from Romans 5 on. And his question is, if God's for us, who can be against us? That expects a negative answer, by the way. And how would you answer that question? If God's on your side, are you worried about anybody else? Are you worried about anybody being against you? When Paul says, if God be for us, he's not saying maybe he is and maybe he's not. In the original text, it's a first-class condition. It can be translated since God is for us or because God is for us. You know, there's no truth more fundamental in all of God's word than this truth. God is for us. The believers, he is for his people. Because of Yeshua the Christ, once and for all, the question is settled, God is for us. All that God is, all that God has, all that God does, he does on behalf of his people. He says, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, he delivered Christ for us, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? This is a typical Hebrew, Hebrew argument. He's arguing from the greater to the lesser. If God put his son to death for you, is he not going to be able to keep you? 
Christ died for you. You think he can hang on to you once you belong to him? Verse 33, who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. To bring a charge is literally the idea to speak out to. It was used as a judicial term in the ancient world to apply, imply a legal accusation. So here's the point. Above God, there's no higher court. If God is the one who acquits you, if he declares you righteous, no one can appeal that. There's no other court to appeal to. No one can call for a mistrial. No one can look for other courts against you. God's sentence is final and it's total. Who's going to bring a charge against God's elect? There's nobody that can. He says in verse 34, Who is the one who condemns? Christ Yeshua is he who died. Yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. God alone condemns and God alone justifies. And if God has covered us with his righteousness, if God has granted to us the righteousness of Christ, we're secure. We're secure. There's no accusation that can stand against us. No one can find anything that could come against us because Christ is righteous. He fulfilled all the demands of the law, and we have that righteousness. In verses 35 through 39, he moves away from the law court language, and he employs the relational language of love. He says, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? The answer expected here is nothing. The genitive Christos is subjective, denoting Christ's love for believers. Who will separate us from Christ's love for believers? And here Paul lists seven afflictions. Afflictions that he himself endured every one of them. He hadn't done, dealt with the sword yet, but he will. You know, these are the things we're hearing about in Voices of the Martyrs. These are what Christians are going through. Who will separate them from the love of God? Do, do these things, as we hear these stories in the voice of the martyrs, do these things separate people from Christ? Seems like they have greater fellowship than we understand here. They're suffering. They're being tortured. Verse 36 is even stronger. Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all the day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Here he quotes from Psalm 44 as evidence that they were suffering and there were trials of this present life, but they were nothing new. Believers in previous centuries faced these issues. You know, trouble can take many things away from the people of God. Trouble can take away our happiness. We get in bad situations, we're just not happy. We're losing our joy. It can take our prosperity away. Trouble can take away your health. It can take your friends away. There's a lot of things that trouble can take away from us, but it cannot remove us from the love of God, no matter how bad things are. It can't remove you from the love of God that is in Christ. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through Him who loved us. We overwhelmingly conquer. Hooper nakao is the word here. From Nike, which means a conquer. We're more than conquerors. We're super conquerors. We're overwhelming victors because of Christ. Paul wanted these transition saints to understand that their glorification was not founded on their goodness. It was founded on God's election. It was not founded on their wisdom. It was founded on God's call. It was not founded on their personal submission. It was founded on God's justification. It's not founded on their perseverance. It was founded on the power of God to keep them. And what holds that all together is the underlying covenant of love that God has for his people. Look at verse 38 and 39. I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Yeshua our Lord. I'm convinced the word means to be fully and absolutely persuaded on the basis of evidence that cannot be denied. He uses a perfect passive 
indicative verb here. The perfect tense brings something like, I was persuaded in the past and I'm fully persuaded in the present. I used to believe this and I still believe it now. I'm absolutely convinced of this. And the passive voice here is very important. Had Paul inferred that his confidence rested on his own experience or his response to God, then he would have used the active voice. That is, demonstrating that it was what he had personally done that brought him this assurance. Then we would be forced to compare our experience with Paul's experience in order to get assurance. But <laughs> we wouldn't like that. But Paul used the passive voice here, which means that he had nothing to do with the action, but rather he was acted upon. His confidence rested in the work of another, not his own. Now the word separate here means to violently tear from, to completely divide. Paul says that nothing can happen that would separate us from God's love. So what he's saying is there's no state of being in which you could ever be separated from the love of God, which is in Christ. Nothing can separate you from that. Now, I've heard people argue on this text and say, well, but I can separate myself. What if I take myself out of God's love? What if I decide to separate myself? What if I decide I don't want to be saved any longer? Can I take myself from God's love? Well, look at what the text says. Nor any created thing. Does, what does that leave out? Are you a created being of God? Do this. Yes, you are. The answer is yes. Then you can't separate yourself from God's love. Why? Because those whom God loves, He loves forever. Those who He saves, He saves forever. Those who God justifies, He justifies forever. If you by faith have come to Yeshua for salvation, He will never cast you out, John 6, 37. And He won't let you cast yourself out. Some people think you could just walk away. Well, again, you don't know what you have if you think you can walk away from it. You know, this chapter started out with no condemnation, Romans 8, 1. And it ends with no separation. This is security. Absolute security. If you are in union with Christ by faith, then these promises all belong to you. You will never be eternally condemned. You will never be separated from God's covenant love. We need to glory in this. We need to apply this to our lives and enjoy it. Instead of walking around in guilt and condemnation, thinking, oh my word, I messed up, and now I'm in trouble. God's love is based on your action. All right, I think we're clear what the Scriptures have to say about this, you know, but someone's going to say, what about those verses that seem to indicate you could lose your salvation? Well, first of all, here's what you do. You, you start by applying the hermeneutical principle of the analogy of faith, or Scripture interprets Scripture, right? And so you look through the Scripture as a whole, and you say, what does it teach? I find verse after verse after verse on our Salvation being secure. And then I find some verses that say, hmm, not sure what this means. Can the scriptures teach our salvation is secure over here and then teach you lose it over here? No, that's, you know, that doesn't make any sense at all. That violates the analogy of faith. So we have to compare scripture with scripture and look at the overall scripture and find out what they teach. And like I said, overwhelmingly the scriptures teach that we are secure. Overwhelmingly. But there are some verses that seem to teach different. Where is the first place you think someone would go that would want to teach you could lose your salvation? Okay. Hebrews 6. All right. No doubt. You know, Hebrews 6, Hebrews 10. Uh, the guy yesterday, he's, are you familiar with Hebrews 10, 26? I said, yes, I am. That doesn't apply to you. You know? It's talking about Jews who are leaving, walking away from Christ. He said, there remains no longer a sacrifice for sin. Because there's no other sacrifice. If you're denying Christ, you can't go back to those temple sacrifices. He's the fulfillment of those. And tried to explain Hebrews 10 to this man. Because he was fearful of that he had done this thing. Well, let's look at Hebrews 6. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened, they have tasted the heavenly gift, they have been partakers of the Holy Spirit, have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away. It's impossible to renew them again to repentance, since they again crucified themselves the Son of God and put Him to an open shame. 
Now, those who believe it's possible for a Christian to lose their salvation and be lost eternally have appealed to these verses for proof of their theory. But we have seen that scriptures teach most emphatically, unequivocally, the divine preservation of the saints. The Word of God doesn't contradict itself. So, he says that these people in this thing have once been enlightened. I, I think some people will look at this verse and say, well, this doesn't even refer to Christians. I think you really have to ignore the text to say it doesn't refer to Christians. This is talking about Christians. They have once been enlightened. Fotidzo, it means to illuminate, to give light, to make see. The rather other use of this in 1032 seems clearly to point to the early days after their conversion experience. It's extremely questionable whether an unsaved man could be said to be enlightened. There's certainly nothing to suggest it here except maybe some bad theology. And they are also said to have tasted the heavenly gift. This is a reference to the gift of eternal life. But it says here, they just tasted it. They didn't really experience it, they just tasted it. Well, let me say here that the word tasted here is the exact same word that talks of Christ tasting death for every man. So you've got a problem if you want to take this to not mean, you know, a reference to eternal life. They tasted the heavenly gift. They also have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit. What do you do with that one? Metahos, it means partaker or companion. They become companions with the Holy Spirit. That the writer had in mind a definite known reception of the Spirit is very clear here from the aorist participle genomai. It means the partners, they became partners at a distinct point. Nichols says this, this expression, perhaps even more than the other, appears to lend support to the view that true Christians are described here. These Hebrews had also tasted of the good word of God. This is the word guomu, and it refers to believers experiencing or appropriating God's word. What emerges from this list is a series which traces Christian experience up to a certain point. The illumination, which results in salvation, which makes possible partnership with the Holy Spirit, under whom we feed upon the Word of God and taste God's power. It says they had also tasted the powers of the age to come. The word powers here is dunamis. This is a New Testament word for miracles. I think it's an allusion back to Hebrews 2.4. In every way, the language here fits true Christians with remarkable ease, okay? But notice verse 6. Here's the problem and then have fallen away. So they know all this stuff, and then they fall away. He says it's impossible to renew them and get to repentance since they again crucify themselves, the Son of God, and put him to an open shame. Now, as most expositors agree, the idea here refers to apostasy. These people are turning away. I think the whole epistle supports this. But what's going on in Hebrews? Very important that we understand the context of the book. Hebrews is written to... Who? Gentiles? Hebrew. Okay, Hebrew believers. Here's the problem these Hebrew believers are having. They're nearing the end of the age. The persecution is great upon them, and they're, they're suffering because of it. So they look at the temple, and they say, I think I'm going to just go back to that. I think I'm going to leave Christianity and go back to the temple worship. And he's trying to warn these people, don't do that. Don't go back there. Because you go back there, you're going to be judged because that city is going to be destroyed and you're going to get destroyed with it if you go back into that city. So he's trying to warn these Hebrew Christians, don't go back there. So apostasy is the issue, but who's turning away here? I think it's believers. They're falling away. They're leaving Christ and they're going back to the rituals. They're going back to the temple sacrifices. A little rendering here, this verse would be, for it is impossible to renew to repentance those who have fallen away. Now, the word impossible here in verse 6 is from the Greek word adunatos, and it means could not do, impossible, impotent, not possible, weak. The verb is active, not passive, so we could render it, it is impossible for them to be renewed. It's improbable that the writer here would say, God can't do it. All right, and I ask people all the time, well, is it impossible to renew them? I said, is it possible for who, God? And, they, and then they said, mm, well, I can't say that. Okay, so the idea here, it's impossible for them to be renewed. In other words, these are Christians. They've turned away. They've got, what are you going to tell them? 
What are you going to tell them that they don't know? How are you going to talk them when they know Christ, when they've experienced Christ? What are you going to tell them that's going to turn them back? You can't do it, he says. It's impossible to do that. God could do it. He could do whatever he wishes to do. But the context suggests it's impossible for us to do or it's impossible for anyone to do. That's the idea here. It's impossible for us to get them to see the light, basically. The statement is not absolute regarding the future of repentance. It's just saying we can't, we can't tell them anything. They know the truth. The reason for the impossibility is given at the end of verse 6. They Since they crucify themselves, the Son of God, and put them to an open shame. Those who renounce their Christian faith are, with respect to their own conduct and attitude, taking a step that amounts to a fresh public rejection of Christ. They're basically rejecting him. By renouncing Christ, they reaffirm the view of Yeshua's enemies that he deserved to die on the cross. In that sense, they're crucifying him all over again. And this is a serious step. They're turning away. And you say, well, how could a Christian do that? I had a man tell me this once in my early Christianity, and I didn't get it. But I get it really now. He said, a Christian can do anything a non-Christian can do, except be eternally lost. And if you don't think that's true, then you don't know Christians too well. Then you don't know your own heart too well. See, we're, we are capable of anything. And I think putting us in the right circumstance, or basically the wrong circumstance, you know, could end up with trouble. And Christians do all kinds of heinous things. They commit adultery. That's a sin that God detests so much. They murder other people. They do all kinds of things. But these people were turning away. Some people just have a hard time believing that a Christian can abandon the faith. I can show you all kinds of people. You say, well, they probably weren't Christians. That's, a, that's just an escape to say they weren't Christians. And not to know, you know, you ever sung the song, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love? I remember singing that for the first time and understanding, yeah, I guess I understand that now, you know. We want to think we're righteous. No, that's not me. I would never do that, you know. Like Peter, Lord, I'll never deny you. That's just pride, people. But the view that a Christian can't turn away, I think, is not biblical at all. I think it's just a theological conviction that, you know, people come up with that can't be supported from the Bible and it really ought to be given up. Well, what about this apostate now? What happens? Is he damned? They've renounced their faith. What happens to them? Well, they may have lost their faith in Christ, but Christ hasn't lost them. Look what he says in 2 Timothy 2.13. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. Amen is right. <laughs> we all ought to be saying he cannot deny himself. Let me ask you some people, do you believe in the grace of God? Someone is bound to say, well, then I guess it doesn't matter how we live. And this is the first argument to grace. Then it doesn't matter how we live. We can do whatever we want. We can go out and murder people. We can do whatever. And it doesn't matter how we live. Listen, yes, it does matter. Let me qualify that. As far as your eternal security, you're right. It doesn't matter. There's nothing you're going to do that God says, that's enough. Boom, kick them out. Well, then why does it matter? It matters because how you live in this life matters. And although it doesn't affect your eternal destiny, it greatly affects the quality of life right here, right now. And I think we got to be really careful that we don't confuse these things. All right, our security, our future eternal inheritance is secure. You can't lose that. But you can damage and mess up your life so badly here and now that you'll want to get out of it. He's, the apostate is safe from Yahweh's eternal judgment, but they're not safe from his discipline. Look at what he goes on to say in the verse in Hebrews. For the ground that drinks the rain, which often falls on it and brings forth vegetation useful for those whose sake it is tilled, receives a blessing from God. Now the rain is a blessing from Yahweh. He provides the rain, and because the rain is coming, the vegetation comes forth, and this is a blessed piece of ground. But if it yields thorns and thistles, it is worthless and close to being cursed. Its end is to be burned up. Believers, we're kind of like a plot of ground that belongs to God. He pours his blessing 
He poured His grace out on us. He gives us these blessings, and we are to honor Him. We are to bring forth a life that brings glory and honor to His name. But when it doesn't do that, when it brings forth thistles and thorns that are worthless, then it needs to be burned up. This is not talking about hell. The fire here is a reference to judgment, temporal judgment, discipline, chastening. People, I think this is obvious. I think, you know, if you just examine humankind and look around and you see Christians who walk away from God, they don't look to me like they're having a great time, all right? I see these people and they're absolutely miserable. They're tormented. Their lives fall apart. They get in all kinds of things, you know, problems and difficulties come in. There's joy in serving Christ. There's happiness, there's peace, there's contentment in serving Christ. But there's discipline, there's chastisement when we walk away. That's how he made it to be. Our joy is to come from him, and when we try to get it from other things, we just suffer for it. This is not an issue that has anything to do with your eternal inheritance, so we've got to make that distinction. So Jude begins this letter by letting his readers know that their salvation is eternal. He's writing about apostates, and he starts out by saying, you're kept. That's a good way to start when you're going to talk about apostasy. And notice how Jude ends the letter. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, to only God our Savior through Yeshua the Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Bottom line is Jude begins saying you're kept. He ends by saying he'll keep you from stumbling. He'll make you stand in the presence of his glory blameless. So front to back, Jude talks about the security of the believer. He starts with it. He ends with it. Just want you people to know you're secure. Now let me get to talking about apostasy for a while, he's going to say. All right? Let me add one other point to this as we close this morning. These three terms, called, beloved, kept, are terms that are used in the Tanakh of the nation Israel. All three of them. They're all used specifically in the Tanakh in connection with the suffering servant of Yahweh in Isaiah 42, 49, 50, 52, and 53. These are terms that were used by Yahweh with reference to Israel. And they are carried over into the body of believers in the New Testament. And we are called, we are loved, we are kept. Why does he use Israel's terms to apply to the church? Because the church is Israel. We are the Israel of God. Those terms he used for his people, he's still using them for his people. We are his people. We are the called, we are the beloved, and we are the kept. Our salvation is absolutely secure. That should give us confidence to live the Christian life. You know, I think it's, you try to encourage people to walk in holiness and live a life of holiness before God. That's really hard to do with someone who's not even sure they're a Christian. You know, well, I'm not sure I am saved. Well, why would I try to live holy? You know, it's not because you're telling them holiness does not get you saved. So it's hard, but when you understand, when you have confidence in your Father, you know you're a Christian, there's a desire in your heart to honor Him by the life you live. When you understand what salvation is, I think there's a real heart attitude of wanting to live a life of gratitude for what has been given to us. Let's pray. Father, I thank you this morning for the security of our salvation. Lord, it's something I did not always understand, something I actually fought against, which now sounds so ridiculous to me, Lord. But I thank you for the truth of your word. I thank you that you loved us in eternity past. You chose us. You called us. You glorified us. Lord, we thank you that it's all of you, and we can rest in that. And all the praise and the glory goes to you, who alone is the author and finisher of our faith. Thank you, Lord, for our security. May it bring great peace to our lives. May we honor you and the way we live because of it. Amen.